Good evening, church, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Cole. I'm the pulpit minister here at Central Church of Christ, and this is uh, Dan Spath. He's one of our elders here at church, and, and here at Central Church of Christ, it's our, it's our mission to be God's heart and hands in this community and beyond, and we do that in several different ways. One of the ways we do that is we have classes like this tonight mm -hmm. uh, where we're in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going we're gonna to talk about it. We're going to talk about the text, and we're going to try to to expose kind of what's there in the text. Another way we do that is we are currently uh, assisting Christians in the state of Guerrero in Mexico in planting churches there. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first started this in, back in the 80s, I believe it was the 80s, yep. um, there wasn't a single church in that state. And uh, now there's over 10. Mm -hmm. And those churches are growing. Yep. And it's, it's all over it's, the place. It's a huge harvest. It's place, great. Yeah. Um, if you haven't watched that video, I want to stop and encourage you real quick. Down in, in YouTube, we've got that video there. It's with Glenn Schmidt, and he talks about the work we do in Mexico. And I want to encourage you. I think if you go on the website, I think it's probably easier to find just on the website. You can scroll down until you get, I don't even know what the date was. I don't remember. But I think the title's there. If the title is there, yeah. You'll be definitely yeah, be able you'll to, be find able to find it. it. It's uh, yeah, our on Friday night discussion on missions, I believe. Okay, that's it. That's, yeah. that's when Glenn was with us. That's yes, it was. Night. Yep. And he goes over the mission work and the history there. And, and I really want to encourage you to go check out that video. Uh, we're real excited about the, the churches that are being planted there, the, the people we're bringing to Christ, and, and it's just fantastic. Well, we, we've had mission work in Jamaica. We've had wish, mission work in Poland. We've had mission work in, in, in uh, El Salvador. San Salvador, I think, was where we originally started, I think. Uh, we've gone to Nicaragua. We have sent some people to Nicaragua. But the one that's been the most effective, the one that's been the most, uh, the, the, the one that's been the best has been the one in Mexico. It's been, it's been the most, uh, uh, had, had the most results is the one in Mexico. Well, and that evangelist we got down there, he's a hard worker. He's really good. He's yeah, a really hard good. worker. Freddie, yeah. Freddie does a great job. He does. And we're so excited. Yeah. We, he sends us emails and we see reports all the time about the, the people yep. that are converting yep. and coming to Christ. And yep. church, if you haven't seen that, please, please go check that out. It's a great video. You find it on YouTube. You find it on our website. Speaking of which, if you're watching this on Facebook, please, please, please make sure to like it and subscribe it, or excuse me, make sure to like it and share it. It really helps us out here. It helps it get it out there and and uh, we want to try to get this and, message and, out. You know, and you know, and can. thank you for the comments that we're getting. We're getting some comments, and I saw some of them the other day. And I don't have a YouTube account, Facebook. I mean, you know, a Facebook account, but, but uh, you know, you showed me some of them, and, and they were very positive, very upbeat, and we want to thank you for that. Yes. Uh, it, uh, you know, I, I don't mind. I mean, if you, if you have a, a negative comment and you said, I think y'all stunk the place up, I don't have a problem with that either. You know, at least we know how to get better. You know. Well, they're they're pretty vocal about it. On the, the comments I've gotten are, you need to turn up the volume. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I can't get the, yeah. apparently I can't get the sound figured out. I, I, I'm really what I'm talking about is about the text. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a problem with, oh, with what okay. we've done with the text? Fair enough. You know, fair but enough. no, it's 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 good. You know, it really is good. We're we're reaching quite a few people, and that's a, that's a good thing. Good thing. Indeed. Something else too that we you didn't talk about yet was uh, uh, we are uh, we are trying to help uh, mid coast supply yes. the pantry. Uh, fill their pantry. They've had a problem getting that done through the food bank and everything. So we've been doing that some, and, and they came today and picked up a whole bunch of stuff. They did. And so now we're, we don't have anything left. Now we've got to start all over again and start accumulating stuff again. So, uh, but they are coming and getting it, and they're using it, and they're very appreciative too, very appreciative of what we're doing. I want to say thank you so much, Church, for your work on that. It's, it's fantastic. I, I know that God is glorified by what we do mm -hmm. and our help with Midcoast. And it's just fantastic. It's really serving families and com in our community, and that, it's just a great thing to see. Well, I, and I, something else too. I, I, I'm, I'm really tickled. I'm pleased about how people really want to get back together. And I understand on Sunday morning they're afraid to, but you know we we uh, we asked people to sign up on a sign-up sheet about the men's breakfast, and we've got 17 guys already wanted to sign up. And we've only when we were doing it when we weren't locked down, we only had about 20 coming. And so we've got almost that many want to come again. So uh, that's really encouraging to me uh, that people really want to be, they want to try to get back to some kind of normal, as normal as they can get, you know, and that's, a, uh, that's a uplifting to me. Well, church, and, and you know this, the world, is, the world wants to destroy our fellowship. The world wants to destroy the church. The world wants to see all of this gone. And so any way we can fight back, any way we can push back a little bit, um, we're not talking about being unsafe. No, we're going to social no. distance. We're going to have the mask. We're going to yep. we're going to do all that. That's yep. that's that we're going to do that. We're going to take care of our neighbor. Yeah, but we do the the fellowship can't stop. No, it can't. It can't, it can't. stop. We've got to find ways to. And I told my Sunday night class, we've got to find ways to 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 get back into some way to fellowship. We've got to do that. You know, we've, you know, George and I have looked at at maybe doing a picnic, you know, when it gets cooler and we can be outside 
take some tables outside and, and do it outside. Does it get cooler around here? Uh, yeah, yeah, about November. <laughs> about November. Maybe, maybe mid-February. Yeah, we'll, 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 <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about maybe doing something like that. Maybe everybody bring their own lunch and we just get together. And, you know, that might be pretty cool to do. You know, do it outside and, you know, that, uh, you know, so uh, there's things that we're looking at. Oh, that's good. Well, we want to see it. We definitely want to see it come back. And, and church, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much for showing up to things like tonight. And thank you so much for those of you who decide to show up on Sunday. And again, if, if you don't, if you don't show up on Sunday, we appreciate you. We love you. And we thank you for living in your faith. We, we and, understand. And, and I'm really, I'm really thankful for people have not quit giving. I know, I know I've heard of churches where they're scrambling because they can't, they can't pay their bills because they're, their congregation has quit giving. That's not happened here. We're, you know, our people are still, they want to give, they bring in checks by. You know, the, there, there's a place on, on our website where you can do, a donate button, you can click and, and, and donate right there on the website, and we'll get it. You know, we'll, Paul's, Paul will de- get that money. And, uh, but it's, it's been really encouraging that been. people are still giving and they still want to give. You know, we're not meeting budget every week, but, but we're getting really close, and that's a good thing. You know, and, and we had 102 people here Sunday morning. We, we've come up from 75 to 80 to 102 this past week. And there were some folks here that had not been here in a long time, and they came. Uh, so, uh, you know, just encourage you wherever you are. If you come in here, if you're not coming, then watch us on Sunday morning. Uh, everything's there live streamed on Sunday morning. So let's get in the text. Well, go ahead and say a prayer. Let's pray, right? and we'll get in the text. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to, uh, uh, to talk together. Uh, Cole and I doing this conversation is a, is a good thing, and, and it's uh, I think it's encouraging to, to our membership and encouraging to those who are watching. And I pray, Father, that you bless us tonight, that we might say things that will inspire and uplift and encourage people, and then give the people that are listening the courage to uh, to apply what they hear to their lives. Father, we thank you so much for this technology and for the ability we have to to put this out on the on the internet, and and so many people can watch so many places, uh, really all over the world. Thank you, Father, and bless us tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. So we're in Ecclesiastes 8. So. We are. We're in Ecclesiastes yep. 8. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, let me, let me ask you, Dan, has there ever been a government official that you just could not stand and did not want to listen to? You got another question? <laughs> you, you asked me, <laughs> what did you ask me before we started? You said I have two questions, and you want, and you asked me something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that I didn't want to listen to. That you just that you couldn't respect. You couldn't respect. You couldn't listen to. You know, maybe they're on the TV talking, and you're turning them off. I'm not gonna call names. No, no, I'm no names. No names. I don't know. That's. Uh, I'm not asking for a name. But but there's been there's been. Uh, uh, yeah, there has been presidents before that, that I was not happy with and what they stood for and, and what their lifestyle was like, I was not happy with. Uh, you know, we've, we've had uh, some elected officials here in this, in this city that, that I was not pleased with. I didn't think they were, uh, they were doing the job that they needed to be doing. Uh, didn't make me want to run, but it, uh, but I, and I didn't get where I didn't listen to them because in our system, we have so many checks and balances that I can disagree with the president, and and generally you have you know a balance of power. Generally, that's the way it was set up by the founding fathers. And so, uh, you know, there there's been times when I didn't like the whole direction the country was going. Uh, I don't like some of the things that are happening now. I don't like the way it's going. Some of the things that uh, that are happening. Uh, I'm glad I live in the state of Texas uh, because we have a we seem to have a a, a leadership that is that's uh, got their head screwed on straight, at least for the most part. Uh, so, but yeah, there has been, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can remember certain people that I didn't, uh, didn't, didn't agree with, uh, knew them. I knew some people here and knew them and didn't particularly care for the stands they took. And, and, uh, and one individual that, I, that, uh, I, that was uh, uh, gotten into gotten some trouble. And I, when it happened, I said, that doesn't surprise me. Right. So it doesn't surprise me they got in trouble. So. 
So how, how do you deal with that? I mean, as, as Christians, we're supposed to respect the government. We're supposed to, you know, uh, acknowledge, you know, in Romans, Paul talks about how they are, you know, given this, they're given a stewardship by God. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do we, how do you deal with that? You know, it's as, easier now, Cole, than it was before because I'm, I'm more mature and I'm smarter. And, and I understand now that, uh, even, even studying something like this, I understand now that, that, uh, uh, that God knows what he's doing when I don't. And if he's got this, if he's got, if he's in control, not if, because he's in control, uh, I don't worry about it as much anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't let that bother me. I've got things to, to, that I have to do, do every day. You have three children to raise. You've got to try to raise them the best you can within the environment that you find yourself in. And those guys are going to do what those guys do. And you've got to trust that God's going to make it beneficial for you to raise your children. Uh, and it doesn't mean it's going to all be good. But they've got to be able to see uh, a, a direction to go from you and your wife. No matter what the government does. No matter what happens. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to trust him first and foremost. But he did set the governments up. I don't know why he set some of them up. I have no idea. Uh, but but that's, not, that's, that's not in my pay grade. Right. That's his job. My job is to stay faithful to him. My job is to, uh, is to, uh, is to not be divisive when it comes to a government. I can, I can not like what they're doing, but I don't need to be uh, divisive. You know, uh, I can do it in a kind kind of way. Um, and I can do it in a way that uh, that elevates them and 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 lets people. Paul said, uh, "Follow me as I follow Christ." If I take that mindset, then you know, if I'm going to follow Christ and they're going to and I'm going to say, "You follow me, guys," I'm following Christ. Christ wouldn't do that. He didn't. He wasn't critical. Uh, uh, he wasn't divisive. He was critical, not divisive. And there's a difference. You don't have to like what's going on, but being divisive means I'm going to cause a problem. I'm not going to cause a problem. God put him there. God knows what he's doing. I don't. So I'm, I can be critical because he, God put Hitler in power. I don't know why, but he did. And so I'm going to say, okay, I don't like what you're doing, but God must have a plan. And he knew you were going to do this, and he put you there anyway. I mean, he put Saul in power, knew what Saul was going to do. And because they wanted a king so bad, they said, fine, I'll give you one. There you go. No reason they picked him is because he was a handsome, had some devil and head and shoulders about everybody else. So they picked that. That's the guy right there. That hadn't changed much, has it? No, no, sir. In all these thousands of years, it hadn't changed much. We're still looking at people from the outward appearance and not really what makes the, what, who their character is and what they are, you know. Well, that kind of leads us right into the text. So, so chapter 8, which is right, that's why I asked the question, right? So chapter 8, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse 1 real quick, where he says, Who is like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. Um, you know, I really think this goes better with the last the, What was that? We should have done this verse. We probably with the rest should have of, yeah. grabbed this verse with, with the rest of chapter yep. 7. Because he's talking about wisdom, and I think, and, and, you know, just uh, you know, uh, just a little bit, an overview here. It, you know, wisdom can, you know, if it's used right, right, you it can make you happier. You know, when I'm smarter now than I was before, and and you asked me that question, you know, I could have been I, when I was growing up. You know, I lived in the '60s, and and we were, uh, I lived in a divisive culture. And it was an anti-establishment culture. And, and there was times when it was divisive. I never got involved in that but because of where I lived. But if I'd lived farther north, I could have easily got involved in that divisiveness and that, uh, that chaos that happened during the 60s. I could have easily gotten involved in it. But as I got smarter, I said, wait a minute. You know, this is not what God's telling me to do. And I think, I think when you get smart, it brightens your face and changes your heart appearance. Because, you know, I can be like this mad about everything that's going on around me. I don't like what's going on around me, but I'm not mad. I'm, I'm curious because I don't know what God's doing. It's okay. I know he's doing it. I just don't know what it is for sure. And we may, I may never know. I may not know for a long time what God's doing. It's like we talked about before when things happen in our lives. 
We don't have to know. We don't have to be. We don't have to be privy to all the information. Well, let's and let's clarify that because we do know a little bit of what God's doing. Yes. Right. We know. We know He's calling people to His name. Mm -hmm. We know He's glorifying Himself. We know that. We know He He does things mm -hmm. to be glorified. Mm -hmm. We know that. Um, we know He's also bringing judge, justice. He's bringing in His judgment when He feels the time is right. Now, understanding that God is incredibly patient. You know, it was 400 years with Abraham before. He brought his judgment on that land, and he brought it through the Israelites, right? Mm -hmm. And so well, there's, there's definitely, those are, we know he's doing these things, but what we don't know is how these specific events accomplish those, that plan. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Right. We, don't, we don't know details. Yeah, we don't know details. And, if you're, and we're detail guys. You and I are detail guys. We are. Yeah. You know, and, and I, want, I want to know, you know, you know, can you tell me this, this, and this, and this? I want to know this, this, and this. And, how are you going to take this horrible event? This horrible event and turn it to good. Because that's, that's essentially what he did with the cross. He mm -hmm. took nailing Jesus on a cross, humanity literally putting to death the very image of God, mm -hmm. putting, it to, putting him to death. He took that and brought salvation and redemption for all of creation, yeah. which is insane. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's from a human perspective, it's nuts. It's crazy. And if you, and if you understand that where we're at, you understand how they were so confused when Isaiah wrote or Jeremiah wrote or, or when Abraham was told, you know, I'm going to, through your seed, I'm going to bless all nations. And then you see a whole culture of, of racism where they, where they were <laughs> racist against, against Gentiles. I mean, they, they were racist against anybody that wasn't an Israelite. You know, and then they turned that racism onto the Samaritans. So, I mean, and you say, okay, well, you understand now how they were confused. Right. Because they didn't know the details. They, they couldn't. We look back now and we can put it together. We can look at it and say, okay, ah, ah, oh, got that. Right. And we can say, now I understand. Well, 50 years from now, people are going to go, ah, ooh, now I got it. We just are living in it and the, you, it's understandable why we're confused. Because we got people that are sick, people that are dying, people are losing their jobs. And so for us, the wisdom is knowing that God is still working. God's and got he's, it. He's, he still has this. He's still working. What this guy comes to over and over, God is in charge. He won't come to that. We're trying to tell our audience that every week. We come to it every week. Every week. Right. He's not, but he will at the end. He will come to it. But God's in charge, so just, be, just fear him and obey his commands. And that, that's the whole duty of man. That's the whole duty. Once you figure that out, well, we're trying to help you guys figure that out every week. That really? God's in charge. So, and let's let's move on because it, it it gets to that again. I think he does. He does get to. He gets to. Uh, I would say he retreats back when when he sees all of these things conflict and none of life making sense. He retreats back into a, a pretty standard argument, which he also condemns mm -hmm. at, at places in the text, which I find interesting. But he kind of retreats back to, well, this is, must be what it is, and of course that's not the case. But let's get there. Yeah. So in verse, I'm going to read verse uh, two through ten. I'm going to read that that right. that whole section there. Uh, obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his commands will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. Since no one knows the future... Who can tell someone else what is to come? As no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the time of their death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice this. Practice it. All this I say as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This, too, is meaningless. Mm. Um, I think we see a lot of stuff in there. I, I really do. And I think it's real easy to look at this and just say, you know, yes, we should obey the king. Well, I think, I think if you take it on a secular level, mm -hmm. okay, he's, he's talking about being obedient to the king. We already alluded to that a while ago. Romans chapter 13 says they, God's put them in power. You don't honor them. Okay, but, it all, but he never says to disobey him in the process. We have a responsibility to be obedient to God. If you take it from a secular 
perspective, and, and Solomon's writing this, and he's, starting, he's a king. You know, you got to listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. You know, but then he says, but even I don't know where the wind comes from. I can't contain the wind. That's all fine and good. But if you take this from a spiritual perspective, I was looking at it as you were reading. I said, you know, if I treat God this way because he is the king, he does know where the wind's coming from. He does send it on its way. You know, and, and when he says in verse 7, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? Jesus even told us, since you don't know what to do, don't worry about tomorrow. You know, Jesus said, I don't even know the day or the hour when I'm going to come back. I have no idea. Only the Father knows. But he does know. And so I, I, if I turn this over to him and say, okay, help me to live my life in the best way I can. Please forgive me my sins because I will commit them and keep me connected to you and honor you as my king. That's from a spiritual perspective. I think it's written from a secular perspective. I think, I think so he's reading, writing it from a secular perspective and saying, hey, you know, well, he stands, he said, it, you know, do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause for he will do whatever he pleases. And the king had that power. He did. You know, in our culture, our president, from, from what's dictated them, don't have the power of absolute control. No, no. And they had, yes. And but in, the king did. Yes, and in ancient times, that was a very common. So, okay, I don't want to get into all that. Um, but yeah, in ancient times, they, had, they did. The kings had this absolute authority. They were the, I mean, they... Judge, they were, jury, execution, yeah, pretty they much. They were despots, you know, yeah. they could... They were the worst dictator. I mean, a monarchy can be with a with a with a bad man on the throne in a monarchy easily, easily. Well, the you have a you have a monarchy. You know, have the queen in England, and it works well. They have a parliament. Who who? There's a checks and balance there. Yes. It's different here. We don't have a king. We have a president. You know, they tried to make George Washington king, and he said, "No way. I ain't nah, -uh. no." And he became first president. But we have a set of checks and balances. It works really well when it's done according to the right way to do it. It's when people start to get out of balance is when they look, you look at it. And that's why it's confusing for people because they're like, wait a minute. How can you do this? That's not what you don't have the authority. When they take their own authority, that's when the checks and balances start to run amok. Correct. And when they start to ask us to do what God didn't ask us to do at that point, not being divisive. But standing up for what God says to do, I think, you know, we may very, very easily and very quickly get to that in this country at some point where we're going to have to make a stand for what's right. Well, and I think verse 4, if we just look at verse 4, right, since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? So let's flash forward this to 21st century context for a second. And let's say, our, let's say instead of a king, a government. Because mm -hmm. for us, it's it wouldn't really be, we don't have a king. And our president, as as both, I would say, both sides of the aisle have gotten, kind of gotten to understand in the last 12 years, because we had a part, president from one side and a president from the other, right? Mm -hmm. um, they both have, have understood that there is a limit to the power that these men have. There yeah. is a limit on the power the president has. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would say, instead of looking at it as, as the king, let's say the government, right? Since a government's word is supreme, or since the government's word is supreme, who can say to the government, what are you doing? And I think that, for as, as a Christian, we need to understand that we are. When the government does things that are horrible, whether it's murdering infants or murdering children or, you know, going after people, going after, uh, you know, a certain ethnic group of people or whatever, I would say that it is the Christian's moral responsibility to stand up and say that's not right. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not about getting divisive and it's not about getting ugly. It's mm -hmm. not about condemnation. But it is about standing up and saying, no, this isn't okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not okay with that. That's not all right. And us dissenting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that is very important for us because as Christians, we are supposed to be the light of the world. Mm -hmm. Paul will even note in Ephesians chapter 3 that part of the administration is speaking truth well, to powers and authorities. I agree. Let's say we have no, we have no voice, okay, where, uh, where, we can in, where we can make influence and impact in somebody's life and, and power. But we do have that kind of impact, and, and we can affect change in people's lives. Correct. That's called evangelism. I don't have a problem standing up for what's right 
and, and saying this is what Bible says about this particular thing. Our government says this is okay. I say the Bible says it's not. And we can, and I've had those conversations with people before when I was teaching them, you know, we, we were having Bible studies with them. You know, doesn't mean I'm going to go stand on the street corner and scream at every car that goes by. So, I, yes, let me clarify a little bit because that's certainly not what I mean by dissenting. I definitely don't mean, uh, and thank you so much because you're absolutely right, how, how do we affect change? And that's, I think it's important that we understand that we do have, an, have, have a responsibility to say, no, I'm not going to follow the world. I'm not going to follow the government mm -hmm. just because the government's saying it's mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to stand here and say, no, that's not okay, that's wrong. But how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And I, I personally wouldn't advocate for saying, let's, hey, let's go stand on a street corner. I think what you've pointed out, I think that's the most important thing because how are people really going to change? Mm -hmm. How is our society really going to change? It's not going, I'm sorry, I just, I disagree. I don't think it's going to change by me standing on a corner and screaming at people. I think it is going to change by me doing exactly what you're saying, which is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, studying the Word of God and allowing the Word of God to change people, you bringing know, people to the, to the one person who really can change them. I don't have Jesus. a problem with, uh, with uh, letting people know where I stand on certain things, you know, within the confines of a Bible study. You know, if I get the opportunity, I know of an individual that got an opportunity here uh, that, was going, that, that went to court uh, with a uh, with a particular guy that was on trial, and he was a defense witness, and they called him, and or, or, I don't remember how, how exactly it went, but they called him, and and this guy was very eloquent, very, I mean, he had a very sharp wit, and he got on the stand, and and basically taught that prosecutor, you know, about the scriptures. And why we believe what we believe, and how, and did a. Did, I wasn't there. I just know what was said, and though you have to be ready in every situation to do that, if that's what comes up, if those opportunities come, you have to be ready in those situations. Uh, most of the time, most of us we're going to get a one-on-one, -on -one, just a shot where we can talk to somebody. But I wanted to read this text in Romans because we have alluded to it for two weeks now. Okay, and we never read it, and I want to read it to them. It says, I want you to listen to this, guys. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one who in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. You know? Now, you can get into a, into a thing where, you know, we've seen kings that God put in place all through the Old Testament. That, that abused and misused and mistreated their people. And they stood up against them. Okay? Uh, and, you know, this, this here is what he's saying. He said, I put them in place, and you need to honor them. But he never gives us, you know, here he says, be honored because they're, they're to do this, they're going to do this. But he says all through the rest of the book, but do not, do not go against what I've told you to do. Correct. And well, and a perfect example of that would be Exodus chapter 1. <laughs> I got it right that time. Exodus chapter 1 with the midwives. Mm -hmm. right? yes. The midwives did yes. not do what Pharaoh told them to do. No. They, no. they didn't. They refused and, to obey. And we know that God put Pharaoh in power. He said he did. He yes. said he put him in power. Yes. And so Pharaoh, if, for those of you who, who might be unaware, Pharaoh asked these midwives to go in and, and basically abort all of these, mm -hmm. these babies. We, we talked about that one of the classes. They asked them to go in and kill all of these children to abort them. And, and they um, didn't. And they didn't. They refused to do so. And they came up with excuses why they couldn't do it. And uh, God honored them mm -hmm. because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And so scripture, Paul says this in Romans chapter, uh, it's chapter what was 13. It? 13. Thank you. I was going to say 12. Rome, he says this in Romans 13, but we can't lift any text up out of the context. No. And so no. We have to understand that there is a broader picture. As Christians, we have the responsibility to be obedient to God first, mm -hmm. and then I would say the government. And, and Paul did that, that. He writes that letter 
I mean, he, he is, he, at, so I don't know if he's in prison when he's writing the book of Romans, but, but he, he goes to prison. If you remember, the church at Philippi is started because he's in jail in Philippi because, because the, uh, the Roman rule has had him thrown in jail. And he's, after he's got been, been beaten, he is singing and praying and an earthquake comes and the, and the gates, I mean, the doors fly open and the Philippian jailer is going to kill himself. And he said, no, no, no. Paul said, we're still here. And the church is established that day because of, because of what they did. They could have easily walked out the door because who, what earthquake comes and just opens the doors and their chains all fall off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but God had a different purpose for it. And because Paul was smart enough, he said, wait a minute, this purpose isn't to run. The purpose is this guy. And maybe they were there. Maybe they had, had watched him listening to them. I don't know. Every situation is different. Well, and, and if we even think about, I mean, we looking at the book of Acts, you know, in, in chapter, when he's back in Jerusalem, it's chapter 20, um, when he's back in Jerusalem and the crowds are rioting at the temple because they've made the claim against him that he brought the Gentiles into the temple, which he didn't do. Um, the Roman soldiers take him, take him prisoner, and they put him on the rack, and they're going to beat him. And Paul looks at the guy about to beat him and says, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen? <laughs> and the dude just like, whoop. Yeah, you keep, yo. Why didn't he do that at Philippi? I don't know. Because maybe the mission's more important. Maybe there was a, maybe he realized there was a mission that was more important than whether he got out of that beating or not. I don't know. Because he did it later. Remember afterwards, yeah. he said, he, he said, oh, no, 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 they need to come out here themselves because they, they've beaten Roman citizens at this point. And they're like, uh-oh, we're yeah. in trouble. Yeah, they were in deep. He yep. could have said it before, and you he know, didn't. It's interesting. But this, but this, you know, I like to look at this sometimes. You know, I understand he's talking from a secular point of view. And, and I understand he's, he's, he's talking from a point of view. We're saying secular, right? But he's he's talking from this point of view of he doesn't he doesn't really get it yet. No, he's, he doesn't. He's struggling to understand how all of these different things are working together because they don't make sense. And and like for example, let's look at verse five real quick. Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. Now he's talking about the king, right? How'd that work out for Uriah? Not good. Yeah. Not mm. good. And, that's, and you I have mean, to explain that because David has slept with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and, and, and David has gotten her pregnant, and she's, he's found out she's pregnant, so he calls Uriah back from the war, has him come home, and then sends him back with his own death warrant in his pocket to give to the commander. And the death warrant says, when the fighting gets the worst, put him in the worst place, pull back from him, and so he'll be killed. And he, and he basically murders her, her husband. So didn't work well for him, did it? No. He had no idea. He had no clue. David gave him two chances to go in and lay with his wife. And he wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do it because he was an honorable man and David was at that point. And yet God says, David's a man after my own heart. What? What? <laughs> you see, the, the, just taking things out of context, sometimes you look at it and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, here he says in verse 5, he says, whoever does, obeys his command will come to no harm. Well, no. I mean, that's not true. People do come to harm. You know, you know, how about, I mean, let's say Solomon wrote this real quick. What did he do with his own people to, for all the building projects again? He enslaved them. Oh, huh. that worked out. Yeah, and his son enslaved them even more. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't say this is very true. I would say maybe, you know, I would say this is there for a reason. I'd say I think he's going to get there. He's going to even mention the fact that this too is meaningless because he's going to recognize that kings can be despots. Yeah. Kings can be wrong. Yeah. They're not always right. Mm -hmm. Even him, with all of his wisdom, there was things that he was struggling with, things well, that he did not understand. And I think that's what he means by, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. And so what he's, his, this is kind of like a warning. You know, we need to, you're never going to go wrong obeying the king's command, right? And that, mm -hmm. I think that's what he's kind of trying to communicate. But the wise heart will know when it's time and, and the right way to come in and say, well, maybe, we sh maybe it shouldn't be like that. And that's why it's so important, guys, what we said a while ago. You know, you know, there, there's, you know there, there'll be 150, 200 people, 250 people maybe watching this thing just on Facebook alone. There may be somebody that you know that you can share this with. And they'll look at it, they'll look at it and say, whoa, wait a minute. That's exactly what I'm struggling with. And you may not even know. So if you're led to share it with someone, share it with someone. 
Because you don't know. Because right here he says, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? You don't know. You know what God's plan is. God's plan is for us to be God's heart and God's hand. That's what that sign on the wall says, right? And this one over here is the vision statement. And this one says that we are, to, we are striving to equip everyone to live out the life of Christ. We are here striving to help you live out the life of Christ. That's what we're here for. Is that not true, Cole? Yes, no, it's exactly and, and right. If, and do we, do we have, we have, you have three kids at home, you know, that you could be with this evening, and you've chosen to be here. You felt this is as, as important as what anything you, and they would say, well, you're a preacher and we pay you, and you know, no, no, that's <laughs> not true. That's not what this is about. I don't want a preacher like that. I want a guy that does it because, because he understands that, that there are things that are going to come that I don't understand, but I know what my job is. My job is to teach them about Jesus and let God add to the kingdom. That's our job. I don't have to know what's going to happen with COVID-19. I don't know. I know of somebody that tested positive, okay, that I know very well. I haven't been around them, but I know them. And, and my prayer for these next few days is going to be, I hope, this gets that person's attention so that I, that because that, when that person had a problem in their life, it came to me and said, I don't know what to do. It just hadn't been enough yet. Maybe this one make it enough. Because I know, I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I have no idea what's coming, but I do know what God's plan is and why he hung his son on a cross. I know why he did that. That's right. And so this guy who's not a member of the church, who, let me rephrase it, he's not been a disciple, okay? And he needs some help. He needs some, he needs some guidance. He needs, he needs, no, he needs to be obedient to his God. And, and I want to help. And maybe he got sick. And he's not really sick. He had, he had it for a couple of days and it's over with. You know, so, but, but he's tested positive. Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes. To get somebody's attention. Go. And then he continues in 8, right? As no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the time of their death. And I think that's, you know, Solomon, or the writer here, uh, it may be Solomon, it may not, but the writer here <coughs> struggles with this, this concept of, you know, meaningless work, mm -hmm. meaningless toil, all because of things like death, because of things like time, time marching forward and ever onward, and then things like chance. And now he's talking about this death again. Remember, no one has power of the wind to contain it, so no one has power of the time of their death. And as no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. And so his, his warning here is that we need to be careful. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful. We need to be wise because, you know, you have this despot of a king who can just come in and, and, mm -hmm. and wipe things away. But even he notes, even he notes no one has power over the time of their death. Even this, even this so-called king here. Yeah. But we serve a king, as you noted, and I thought that was very good. As you noted, we serve a king who does. Yeah. We, we, ser do. we serve an awesome king who does have power over That's death. why, as, I was, as you were reading this a while ago, I was looking at it and saying, from a spiritual perspective, I, you know, all of these things he's talking about, my king knows all of this stuff. My king does know what, what's coming. My king does know the time of my death. My king has the hairs of my head numbered. He knows how many hairs I have on my head. A lot less now than I had 20 years ago. But he, but he knows every time one of them falls out. He, understand, he knows. That's how well he knows me. He knows the sins I commit. He knows the sins I committed yesterday, the sins I committed today. He understands. And he forgives me and loves me anyway. Mm. All I have to do is strive to follow him. I will not get it right. Neither will you. Neither did Paul who wrote Romans because Paul says in the book of Romans in chapter 7, he says, the things I want to do, I cannot do. The things I do not want to do is the things that I do. He is struggling with his own mortality, with his own spirituality. And he said, who will rescue me? Oh, and in Philippians, he says, forgetting the things that have passed, yep. I'll continue to strive on. Yep. Um, so, so, yeah, in Corinthian, you know, yeah, he talks about it a lot. I was just looking at this. It says no one has the power over the wind. You remember he talks to Nicodemus, Jesus does, in John chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And he says the wind blows this way and that way, and you don't know where it comes from, where it's going. <laughs> you, know? you know, 
Sometimes yeah. I'm not even sure meteorologists know where it's coming from, where it's going, or how it got here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not so sure, especially when they're wrong sometimes, you know. But, you know, I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, you know, none of us really know for sure the deep, deep things of God. We don't know. Only God knows those things. And this guy will come to that. We're trying to tell you, if you've got an issue in your life today, today, and it looks bleak, or you know someone it looks bleak, share this thing with them. Let them know that even this smart, smart guy, smartest guy, you know, I'm going to take it that Solomon wrote it, smartest guy that ever lived. He is struggling with things that we struggle with. And we say, well, how come he was struggling with it? He was supposed to be so smart. It doesn't make any difference. Just because you're smart don't mean you can, don't mean you got to handle all this stuff. Sometimes it's beyond all of us to understand some of this stuff. And that's pretty much what he says in verse 9. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There's a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. Mm -hmm. In other words, all this I saw, I tried to, tried to kind of wrap my head around what's being done and being done under the sun is, is his way of saying here on earth, right? Um, there's a time when a man lords it over others. He's the one in charge. He's lording, lording it over people, and it's to his own hurt. Solomon lived through that. Yeah. His son lived through that. Yeah. I would say David lived, lived through, through it. that. Yeah. Um, then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. So when he's talking about this idea of being the wicked being buried, it's this idea of them receiving proper or honored burial. That's kind of what, kind of the idea that's trying to be express, expressed there. For us, everybody gets buried. For us, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the murderers get, I mean, mm -hmm. prisoners get, everybody gets buried. In their culture, this is, he's talking about like this being honored. And so those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. And they were wicked people mm -hmm. and they received praise. Well, he just said up here, as no one is discharged in a time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. Well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying these wicked are receiving praises. And earlier in the text in chapter 7, he said, well, maybe just a little wickedness is okay. Yeah. Right? So. You see how he's struggling. He's struggling. And that's my point. I'm see, not, and that's what we're trying to do is trying to point out these inconsistencies in his, not, not, not in that he is, there is a, there's a reason for this book. Yes. To yes. get us to chapter 12. Yes. And to understand that even a most powerful, a most respected individual can struggle just like you do. You're no different than this guy was. He is looking at chapter 7 says one thing. He contradicts it in chapter 8. So it's not that the text is wrong. It's that you're getting a snapshot of this guy's mind and his life trying to come to grips with things that he can't come to grips with. And he's looking at it and saying... I don't understand. This too is meaningless. Is meaningless. Is yeah. how he ends verse. Yeah, you know, and I want the guys. I want them watching us to know, man. This is a very applicable text to us today, because of all the things we're going through right now. We're going through so much that that looks. You know, there are people out there that believe our government has failed them and wronged them. There are others out there that believe that that our government can do no wrong. There are people out there that are looking around and saying, I don't know what to believe. And then there are people that just don't care one way or another. And they say, it's always been like this, always be like this, what's the, what's the point? We're seeing bad actors get rewarded left and right. Yeah. We're seeing people who are evil and wicked and hurtful get praise. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, all of this, you're absolutely right. This is very applicable. It's very applicable today. So if you're struggling with this and you're looking at it and saying, I don't understand, I don't, it doesn't, I, I can't wrap my mind, understand something. It's always been like this. It's always. We're just taking it on the chin right now. But it's always been like this. People, learned, educated, you know, elevated people have always looked and said, I don't understand I wish I understood. And people have walked away from God because, well, I, you, ought to, you ought to make it more clear to me. And you don't, so I, I don't trust you. I'm done with you. And we've had people that, and people are going, people are going to be judged by God at some point, And I don't have to do the judging now. Let God do it. Let him deal with it. My job right now is to make sure that this vision statement and mission statement gets done in this place. And people will be blessed because of it. 
And we're going to be, we're going to be talking about quite a bit. We've, so in, our sermons have been focused on mm-hmm. um, the identity, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who we are. Yeah. Right? Who am I? Who, that who, question. Is, who is the, what's the identity of a Christian? What yes. do they look like? So I preached, I think the, the first sermon I preached after I, I got here was uh, out of Genesis, and it was, who am I, just looking at, at who mm-hmm. God made humanity mm-hmm. to be. What was mm-hmm. his intent and purpose? Mm-hmm. What, who were we supposed to be? And then I looked at, um, from there, we pivoted, and I started looking at, who is the church? And we started with Christ, and then we moved on to Ephesians, looking specifically at the church. We're, we're going to be pivoting now, mm-hmm. and we're going to start looking at, why am I here? Yeah. And we're going to look at it from the point of view of the church. We're not going to look at the greater world. That is, there. I mean, I could talk about that, but I want to look at for us. And, why and are specifically we here? here. Yes. The church here. Yes. Not not the church as a conglomerate or as a as a whole, but the church here. Yes. What is this congregation? At least that's what I hope you're going to do. I, I'm re- I it's read going to narrow down. I'm coming out of Ephesians. Okay. So obviously Ephesians was written to a, a it, was, it, was, it was more than likely a circular letter that was written to a broad sure. audience. Sure, sure. Um, not just the church in Ephesus. But, and then and a lot of the letters were like that. They were meant to be sent to other churches. And so I'm going to start broad, but we're going to narrow it down. Well, like yeah. anybody that's watching this that's ever stood behind a pulpit, you know that at some point when that 25 to 20 to 30 minute time frame, you've got to point it, you've got to get it pointed right between somebody's eyes. I mean, yes. you've got to get it, yes. you've got to get it pointed back. You've got to pull it back in and point it to them. Correct. And that's what we're trying to do with this here. Yes. You know, this is a very broad, very, there's something different and I can't wait for next week. <laughs> I, I, I really can't because we've already dealt with this on Friday night. Yeah. On a Friday night when we've already dealt with this, the mindset that he has here. Oh, I know. What does he drink and be merry? That'll, that'll <laughs> fix everything. You know, well, God's already, and we may go back and read that told that whole uh, story about what happens to that guy, because uh, because God's very specific. Oh no, you don't. No, you don't, because you don't know what's coming. Right. You know, we don't know what's coming tomorrow, guys. You know, we don't. You know, we we hope. Uh, you know, we look at everything the government's doing, and we hope that there that there'll there'll be some kind of civility. You know, we hope that yeah. the the that we know. The right guy will be elected come November. May not be your guy. But the right guy, God's guy, is going to be elected. Because God's already said he does that. So we're going to, we're going to trust God. And we're going to keep going. And we're going to stand up for the truth. Even if it means we have to, we may have to stand on the street corner someday and stand, and stand up for the truth. We may have to stand up here. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm no, not sure. But we're going to strive to understand and strive to share that with them with with the, our audience every time. No we matter sit what here. happens, we're going to glorify God. Ever, absolutely, that's it. I'm here stammering and stuttering around, and you said it perfect. We're going to hear to glorify God. We're going that's to we're glorify here to God. Period. No matter what. We are His church. We're His people. We're His nation. Yep. And even if it means and we ejection, pray. and we're going to pray, hardship. and we're going to pray that God puts a government in power here that can help us to do that. Yes. That can help us to reach out to the lost and glorify him. But no matter what, his will be done. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. And so, brother, I think, uh, I think, I think we're good. I so, think so. I can't wait for next week. It's gonna next week we're going to get after it, man. All right, let's fun. pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity we've had tonight. I pray that someone who's been watching has been, has been influenced and impacted by this, by this class. Uh, it truly is a harsh time. And it's a hard time. And sometimes when we want answers so bad and we're not going to get them, Maybe we have to get a little more simple. God, you've told us what you want us to do. You want us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You want us to glorify you. You want us to be obedient to you and follow you and follow your son. Help us, Father, with the, with the strength and the courage to do that very thing. Bless us, Father, as we do that and help us to be an influence on a lost and dying world. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.